so yes, and well, I think we're just going to chin wag about what's going on in our experiences and that. But the last, I mean, when was the last time we chatted, Carolyn? Was it? I remember. I think I was sitting in front of my log fire in Spain. I had you this memory. Sitting, that's right. And I was in California, mm -hmm. and now you are in London, and I am in Vermont. Yeah. Well, not in London, but in the UK. Oh, that's right. You are yeah. you're in the village where your parents are and where you grew up or no? I didn't grow up here, but my parents came here when I went to university and then I never came back. You uh -huh. know, I went out into the world. Um, so I am in the UK when sometimes I say to people I'm in my secret bunker. Um, <laughs> because no, no, no one actually knows where I am. I'm not sure. You know, some days I don't know where I am myself. But um, yeah, back in the UK after twelve years in Spain, and you're and you're in Putney, Vermont, yeah. That's right. And how do you know that? Well, I remember you mentioned it, and it just tweaked because I just finished reading the uh, memoirs of uh, Charles Knott, who was a disciple of of Gijif, and mm -hmm. he spent a couple of summers at a at a school, at a kind of, a lady had, had organized this special kind of integrated school in Putney, Vermont. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know about that school. I do, yeah. Ah. And, and he was there and he was talking about it in his memoirs. And then shortly afterwards, you said to me, I'm in Putney. <laughs> yeah, well, synchronicities do abound lately, which I think is one of the signs of, of things changing, mm -hmm. um, hopefully in a positive direction. But... We're going to go through hell first, I believe. It seems like it. And I think we, we've we been talking about this for a while because way back when we were both kind of world shifters, we were in kind of the world shift kind of area. And you had written the world shift now, wasn't it? That's right. That's right. And you kindly sent me the copy. And we've been chatting about the shifting world ever since. So when was that book came out? It was about 10 years ago you wrote that. Mm -hmm. I wrote it about 10 years ago. Um, it was way before its time. Uh, so I self-published it. And then, whatever it was, eight years later, it was picked up by the ICRL Press, which is the Pair Laboratories. Does any any of those words mean anything to you? No, but I looked at your bio recently, and I, I picked up the, the, the this new press you've been uh, releasing with. Right. So that's the same one. ICRL stands for International Concert, International Consciousness Research Laboratories. That's what it stands for. And it's uh, indeed a an, an very interesting international organization that I have published now three things with. And the woman who was the publisher died this year. Um, right before my most recent book came out. And it's her son who is taking over. And her son is even more brilliant than she is. So we're gonna we're continuing together. And um, who knows what will come out of our connection. Right. And just, just to kind of go on to that, I, I say I looked at your bio, um, your recent one that you put on your, your kind of web page podcast. And I want to read from that just I mean, I know you more kind of casually from our talking, um, but in case we are going to show this video to anyone, um, it said, do you mind if I read it, Carolyn? Uh, go right ahead. Okay. I don't know if I've ever read it. <laughs> well, I think it'd be nice to share this because you've had such a varied history and background. It says, I love to write and I love to dance. And I use both as vehicles for my work as a healer. Improvisation is what I teach. And as every moment seems to bring unbidden opportunities from the universe, every day of my life is filled with beauty and surprise. A static experience is the goal of my work, and I see ecstasy as the ultimate healer of all, from the personal to the cosmic. Over the years, I have given birth to three children, been a midwife in India, sung in a gospel choir, started a farm, taught my technique of dance healing, started a hunger organization, Daily Bread, built a straw house, a straw bale house, written 11 books on matter and spirit, stayed married to the same man for 58 years until his death in 2015, started the Common Space Community Land Trust in Sonoma County, 
I'm embarrassed. This is and awful. Become a member of the Wild and Radish community of North Northern California, where I'm helping design a program for elders aging and dying in community. Well, that is a varied history, Carolyn. Yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, hearing it read by you or anybody is, is a little bit um, overwhelming. Um, you know, the reality is I've had 85 years to do all of this. So you get old enough and you've had experience. But I, I'm embarrassed in a way that I have listed it for any, I mean, it just makes me so unapproachable. And no. it's just a matter of just doing one thing after another and being um, essentially a, a creative artist and creative mm -hmm. artists are always looking in new pockets of the world. Yeah. And no, I think I think you've yeah, I think you deserve to to give up. I mean that's only a, a small I think splattering of what you've done. It's just like tip of the iceberg. So I remember for uh when we were kind of sp sporadic emails now and again over the years, you had spent quite a few years in that was it North Carolina community, the wild radish one as a as a kind of elder there. Yes, was that, that was California. Um, well, I finally left it. So th that's where I have come from to get to Vermont. Um, it was it was interestingly dysfunctional. Um, <laughs> and inevitably, really, we were trying to do something uh, very complex, which is, and to do it during COVID, which was to have an integrated community in a place where the um, the the mood between white people and people of color was not very positive. Um, although California was, if you were gonna try it anywhere, that was the place to do so. But we got into every kinds of trouble, inevitably. And those of us who were starting it were not mature enough to take on, mature enough or experienced enough, really, to take on something as um, as I am losing language, just so you know, um, but some, it was a, it was difficult, mm -hmm. and people were not having an easy time with one another in general in the society, and then in particular on this piece of land, right when COVID started, and we basically had to we were stuck together, like it or not. And so it didn't, from my perspective, it just didn't work. And it was, I realized I was too old to take on the difficulty of that kind of a, of a, of a dream. And I'd always wanted to be in Vermont. And so I said, okay, it's now or never. Mm -hmm. right. You think that's probably the sign of the times? Because, I mean, especially from 2020 onwards with all the, the pandemic um, stuff, let's say, um, there was a there seemed to be a kind of breakdown in social bonds and and I mean the whole point I think about world shifting and people developing was you can you go through seeds you, you seed energy and people and communities and ideas and you were in a kind of seeded community but then at, at the same time the world was going through this breakdown of social alliances I mean do you think I mean how do you see this do you think a particular energy came into that time which was really breaking down social cohesion? Uh, I do. And interesting that you should ask that and, and put it in those terms. I think that's what's happening on the planet. Mm -hmm. And my sense is um, that it has to happen because what I believe is underlying all of those stuff that's going on in the world is the shifting of the of the frequency of vibration upward. We are, it's a, it's a time of consciousness change and we don't know how to, we don't know what to do. And then right in the middle of it, we're stuck together with a small group of people and not allowed to go out. So I think that was very significant and learning, you know, first of all, accepting that and then learning how to do it is what I believe we're still in the midst of. And I think we have to do it if we are going to be able to raise the frequency of vibration of the consciousness 
uh, on the planet. Mm -hmm. So those of us who, who can look at it that way can be deliberate about it. And what I'm learning here in Vermont, I'm also living in small community here, um, is that the young people, young, I guess I mean starting from birth, and I'm finding it into the early 30s, uh, are variously born damaged. That is to say that they're stuck between um, frequencies. Mm -hmm. And it's it's what's called being on the spectrum. It's what's called autism. It's it's got various names to describe this this behavior pattern that is not easy to live with, either for the people themselves or their families and communities. So I'm watching it everywhere I go, and um, and am horrified, but also fascinated, and have a sense that it's that it's necessary that we go through this um, because it's it's like things are ratcheting up in frequency and everybody is uncomfortable and everybody's got a different reason for it and a different experience of it. But I don't know anybody who's just easy peasy right now. Mm -hmm. So if that's what's happening and for myself, if I can be conscious of that, how do I, how do I behave? How do I live my life in such a way that I support it rather than run away from it? And how do I stay balanced myself? That's the key word, balance. Yeah, interesting. You say that you you feel that the new the new birth, the really young, you know, literally the youngsters are kind of damaged. I would ha I kind of had the impression before that, like my generation, for example, would be the kind of bridge generation. I think I referred to them when I was doing the Phoenix Generation book that we were in the middle of, of the old world and new world coming in, and we would find the transition more uncomfortable because we were like between two ages. But those people coming in, i.e. the new people being born, um, would be more acclimatized. But, but you probably got a point there because I thought that the young people being born would be born into a world which was already stabilizing the transition the change but it seems like i think um we didn't realize probably we couldn't foresee how uncomfortable these years were going to get so perhaps being born into this world now is not a good time because it's, it's in chaos and it hasn't as you say the vibe the kind of frequencies are in no man's land they're going between one era and another era like you throw two pebbles in a pond and each pebble has the ripples going out, but when those ripples meet, you get the interference pattern. And it seems like perhaps we're in that interference pattern now, and we've had more years behind us to get ready for it, but maybe the younger people haven't had more years, but maybe they're not as aware about it, as sensitive. Do you think they're more, do you think they're sensitive as as we are about picking up this, this disturbance, interference? I, absolutely, or if not more so. And I also, I when I first kind of noticed the pattern of this a couple of decades ago, I thought it would all happen in a generation, maybe two generations. I don't think so anymore. I think this is a process of multi-generation. You know, we've got we've to be thinking in terms of, oh, I don't know, 200 years hmm. at least. Um, and it's going to be just it, it's a it's a learning process of the soul. And so, uh, you know, the particular human lifetime is a very short period. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's and the soul is, you know, learns however a soul learns. And it's bit by bit by bit. So any expectation that I'm going to see it in my lifetime or that my children are going to see it in their lifetime, I think is um, is not realistic. However, even having said that, you can still, or I I, I look for it all the time. So I notice, I notice the subtle changes. I notice the difference between my generation and maybe even myself and my grandchildren. My grandchildren are now all in their early 20s, 
And so they are, you know, they are the new adults. And I see them sort of crossing the mindset of what they grew up with, with their parents, and their own searchings in in a in a in a direction that I would call more multidimensional. So they are having that more multidimensional experience without being able to call it that or without sort of knowing that they are. They're just kind of living their lives. I think that's the, that's the key thing. There's like knowing about it and being able to kind of put a term to it. Um, things like, you know, we've been, me and you have been talking for years about, you know, conscious evolution and all this, you know, the transitioning, et cetera. And I, I don't know about you, but the people I, I speak with, like, who I, you know, I let's make let's say my my network of colleagues and friends, we're all talking similar language. You know, we talk about the transition and all this, and there's a there's a certain degree of conscious awareness about what we're going through, you know. And I sometimes tend to think that perhaps um, you know there is a, a great degree of conscious awareness, but then you know if I go down down my local pub in the village. Um, you know, it's, it's a different type of awareness. People are aware of um, whatever's being told to them on the mainstream news, and that's it. You know, end of story. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so that it makes me. You know, I think I'm in a I'm in a certain kind of reality set where this is my language, this is my references, my my understanding. But if I step out of that, there's a huge gulf. Mm-hmm. Have you ever noticed that? ever notice that you are speaking my language. Yes, that is my experience every day. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I moved, well, I mean, this is hindsight, but I wanted to experience that. And I, that's, I wanted to experience what ordinary folks were thinking and feeling and recognizing rather than my group of friends, because yes, we, we talk about this stuff amongst the people who I have chosen as my community and friends all these years. But now I find myself in a tiny little village in Southern Vermont, very different. And I'm living with, I mean, just by happenstance, I have, I find myself living with a group of Christian mystics. How did I find that? I don't know, but I found them and I was very, I thought, oh goody, I'll belong. And I can talk to these people about what's going on in the world. Well, not on your life. Not at all. Um, They they are, um, what what to say? I have to not speak too loudly. But uh, these are people from the working class. Mm -hmm. And the working class are the folks at the pub, basically, in in your, you know, Mm -hmm. in a British, British setting. And they have... They look at the the evening news and they believe it. And they have all their relatives who get together for Thanksgiving and everything, who who are whose set of interests are 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 what they are, but they are not mine at all. So money is very important and appearance is very important. And eating familiar food is very important. So like yesterday, I made, I cooked up some beets and then I pickled them with, with vinegar and olive oil, and nobody would eat it. No, <laughs> <laughs> too unfamiliar. Uh-huh. So that that sort of thing, you know, that what that what they grew up with, what their habits are, where where their minds go, and this particular group of people, you know, Christian mystics, are at the uh, cutting edge of their own society, mm-hmm. and they're not they're you know thirty generations behind what I take for granted. Mm-hmm. So yes, I do know that experience, and it's very lonely, and it's very difficult to uh, to figure out how to behave and how not to make a big deal of the fact that I think differently. Um, you know, how to fit in without losing my own grounding, etc. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, it's important that 
you do fit into your environment. And, um, you know, the, there's the old phrase, you know, it says speak to people according to their level of understanding. You know, you don't go in there and, you know, missionize your your understanding to other people. And, you know, many times when I'm out in my my village or, or pub, you know, I, I keep my mouth closed and just talk about the weather, you know, the, the common conversation. Um, but interesting you say about the mystics thing, because it seems to me like, like um, all cards are off the table. Like it doesn't matter what what kind of um, where you place yourself. It's a place of resonance. So all the names, all the categories are irrelevant. So you can be a mystic, as you say. And also, I think a couple of years ago, when the, especially when all this pandemic started, a lot of people I noticed uh, online who put themselves into spiritual categories and gurus and life coaches were, well, you know were kind of spilling off stuff confused and and towing the the mainstream news and all this and you're thinking but I thought they would have known better you know so it seems like it doesn't matter whether you call yourself a life coach or guru a spiritual teacher or a mystic I think what we're going through now is a is a, a vibrational as you say a vibrational thing so you're either there or you're not no words no category nothing else will will cover it up mm -hmm. it? yeah yeah, and it's it's lonely, mm -hmm. you know. But so let me ask you: When you moved from this group of people, with whom you had a kind of vibrational understanding, in Spain, to a, a British village, um, how how did you find your circle? Small. <laughs> well, the thing is. I mean, I moved back, you know, primarily for, for family. And so I don't have any contacts here. Oh. Um, so, no, I don't know anyone. Literally, I mean, because I know one or two people in the village vaguely because I, I come back every Christmas to see my family. Mm -hmm. Because I say my family moved here at the same time I went to university. So I never lived in this village. Uh -huh. So they know of me. And, you know, um, so I don't, I don't have any contacts. My old friends have all moved away. My friends that I grew up with all live around the world. So, um, in fact, I had to keep my Spanish phone number because I don't, I don't have any English contacts. <laughs> um, so, but what I found was that, you know, when I first came back, people would say, you know, what do you think is going on with the world? And I, I, when I would start to speak, I realized that, you know, we weren't on the same wavelength and they mm -hmm. found it antagonistic. Like, um, so, the best thing to get on with people is you don't enter those subjects. Right. So okay. we don't talk, you know, so now if I meet them, we don't talk about the state of the world. We don't talk about the transition. Um, you know, we talk about what's going on in the village and, and, you know, how's life. So it's a different kind of merging or blending in. I mean, I think most people here don't know even what I'm involved in. And probably would would be scared. If yeah. They well, scared they might think, um, if you know, well, my language just wouldn't get across. If I said, you know, evolutionary transitions and, and you know, consciousness and all this, it's like, um, so don't you write novels? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> and then you go into a different subject. So again, my world is small here, but my I feel my world is much larger by going out. Yeah. And, you know, it's there's many of us connecting around the world that we're on a similar wavelength and we can connect with them. But it, it's always seemed to me much harder to. To be amongst people close to you physically. Um, and it's a different it's a different environment, but you connect to Egypt because there's more of you dispersed than mm -hmm. concentrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I here's here's the way I have found myself using the experience that I'm in now, uh, I've been here for a little bit less than a year, is to use um, my village and my housemates as research. So mm -hmm. I, this is, you know, the how do people think and feel in the larger world, you know, rather than my small group who speaks my language. So 
How, wh what are they thinking about? What are they frightened of? How are they feeling about their children, about, about the government? You know, what is, how do they vote? Mm -hmm. Things like that. And I, so I basically keep my mouth pretty shut and my ears as open as I can. Uh, and then when I have had enough, which I do every day, say, I can't take it another minute, mm -hmm. I just close the door and go and have my own thoughts and read my own things and write my own things. So, you know, and I also feel very strongly that it's either all of us or none of us. So I have to not be the snob that I naturally am and assume that I can only be around, you know, people who resonate with me. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to, if, I would like to teach without teaching, you know, mm -hmm. to be a demonstration model of, of, I don't know, of whatever the hell I am. I don't know, but I'm different from the others. Well, I think we can, you know, um, we know like cymatics, the, the energy, the law, you know, the energy of, of vibration that you put a, you tune the vibration and the, the, the sand or the elements attune themselves to the vibration. Don't, you don't have to say any words. It's just, I think, I think there's a, a strong thing to say that your, your presence can make change, which is, non-visible mm -hmm. um but i mean i'm also thinking that i don't feel that everyone has to has to have this understanding either i mean this level of of references i mean right. because again it, for a lot of people it's very kind of too intellectual or philosophizing or too highbrow talking about evolutionary change and transition um i, I sense a lot of people are picking it up anyway mm -hmm. but not verbalizing it they they just feel that something's changing or you know their priorities are changing they may not know why but they've got an urge to change the way they do things mm -hmm. um shift their maybe some behavior patterns so i think we can all go in the same direction but not not all be conscious of it or have the same understanding or comprehension of it right i i think that's correct as well as the fact that we now have an internet all over the world Mm -hmm. And so there's all kinds of information on that that you can tune into. Um, you know, Greg, Greg Braden is out there 500%. And he's he's an edgy, you know, he's on the edge. Like that edgy, he's a, <laughs> I wouldn't call him edgy, but he <laughs> is on an edge. Mm -hmm. And has, a, you know, he's just excited and smart and, and likes... To you know, likes to share his thoughts. So, um, and there's a lot of that going on on the web, and that was never available before. And this is what the first, maybe second generation to have that access to thoughts and people all over the planet. So, these ideas are getting out there at the same time as the opposite is getting out there you know it's 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 um uh, it's so scary it is so mm -hmm. scary to, because there's there is so much danger out there on so many levels as i see it and um oh but let's put that aside for a minute because i have a specific question for you as um as an englishman which is, what is going on with the monarchy? Are we seeing the beginning of the end? And if so, how do you feel about that? Well, I'll answer the, the second part of the question first. Um, I'm happy with it because I, I'm not a monarchist. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think there is a change. Um, well, first of all, I think that um, the support for the monarchy has been more with the older generations here. So when Queen Elizabeth II passed, um, a lot of her following passed with her, in a sense. Uh, so, you know, King Charles, Charlie Boy, doesn't have the same support that his mother had. Um, so I think that's one thing. And I do feel that younger people are, are questioning the idea of why do we need 
um, certain family figureheads. Because of now, there's a lot more information about these eyebrow families. And, you know, the monarchy is now getting kind of, I think the monarchy, for a lot of people, they're being associated with elite families. The idea that this high level of families have privileges, they have power, they have a certain amount of control and and, and money and money and manipulation and and they you know so i don't think they're popular in the same way and i think people are realizing saying well what happened to the sovereign self you know because under the monarchy you're still seen as subjects mm -hmm. and i have a dis i've had, I had discussion before and i don't try and get into these discussions but people say oh the monarchy has no power and you're just a subject by name. They're never going to, you know, lord it over you as a subject. But I'm saying, well, you know, why should this notion of us being subjects to a family even exist? Even if they don't overtly put it into operation, the idea, the energy still exists behind it. Yeah, you know, so we're not in that, we're not, in, I don't think we're in that epoch anymore. If we really would do want to evolve human culture, human civilization, human consciousness, we have to leave these old patterns behind. Yeah. And I feel that the idea of certain families, for whatever reason, I mean, these families being, you know, stabbing each other in the back and intermarrying and killing people to get into power for generations. So, you know, they're quite, um, they're, they're quite um, badly behaved, to put it diplomatically. Um, so why I think the idea that a certain small group of privileged people should have this status and power and money is is no longer a civilizational pattern, which which fits into the to the energy going forward. Mm -hmm. So um, I do feel the British the British monarchy are going to try and change their image with the if if their younger children get into in, in, into positions, but I feel that. Over time, as you said, over time and gradual movement, the energy just doesn't support older patterns anymore. Mm -hmm. And the monarchy and, and some of these elite families, I think, are going to, you know, just not be able to, to stay in that position because the energy doesn't support them. And for some, for some reason or the other, they'll find themselves being pushed away from the momentum of civilization moving forward. Mm -hmm. But right now, they're in this maelstrom of cent of this, I think, artificial centralizing of power. And they know that their energy is, is on the way out. And so they're, they're trying to, I think, um, overtly trying to keep their power by whatever means possible. Um, well, except for Harry, who is doing the opposite. I, I find him and his choice of, of bride fascinating. Because, you know, I mean, she barely looks black, but she's a black woman. And there are people who do not like that at all. And they're very vocal about it, which makes it, you can't hide it. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's right in your face. And I, I must say, I, I want to pat him on the back and go, I say, go for it. Because what's happening, I think, is that the 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 sort of you know it's this great monarchy but when you look inside the closets it's really small potatoes you know there's not a whole lot of character there that and mm -hmm. diana diana showed that i i'm i'm a i'm a watcher of a fascinated watcher of the british monarchy mm -hmm. and she you know she tried and mm -hmm. was killed for it basically yeah and um and now her son is is doing it in his own way. So you know, going back to my notion of how long these things take, I see there are two generations that now have been pushing in that direction of change. Elizabeth is gone now. Um, Charles, God bless him, chose the most inappropriate woman as his queen. Who I thought her crown was going to fall off in the coronation. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's like a farce and you can't yeah. escape the fact that it's a farce. Yeah. It, it's a show. I mean, the whole, this, 
this over ritualizing is part of of the show the game you know mm-hmm. and and those people who try to impress themselves with power on the game they utilize ritual and i think ritual is also a, a mechanism for imprinting thought patterns belief sets it's a programming so mm-hmm. you know you have you have certain rituals in in most um institutions when they want you to abide by adherence obedience um now ritual can be a positive thing if it's used in a in a sacred manner but you know if you use ritual as a ritual is being used as program and i think the royal family showed that with this big spectacular coronation which which you rightly said looked a bit like what well, you know i call it the theater of the absurd you yeah. know yeah. Um, and and yeah. media entertainment um sadly even warfare is all being ritualized and staged through the the lens of the observer i.e the media mm-hmm. so what what we're getting this end through the lens and through the media is not what's on the ground we're getting this 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 whole kind of stage managed performance okay. you know and it, it's desensitizing us because we don't have we don't have a, we're so distanced from the reality Right. Well, you know, I, it reminds me of a story um, a, about colonization. I mean, the whole notion of colonization, which is what the Commonwealth is built on. Mm-hmm. So my daughter, who is a musician, was asked to play at, at Buckingham Palace for some meeting. And so she was, uh, she actually played in the big red, red, anti-entry hall mm-hmm. um, and got some pictures taken which I saw and so there she is my beautiful daughter playing her viola and behind her is a huge portrait an oil portrait of uh, a man with a gun and uh, he was one of the great colonizers of some place and I I fell apart. I just started weeping rather hysterically. Fortunately, could not be heard in London. But um, there was my child in this coveted position, you know, playing beautiful music at the palace and realizing, oh, my God. I mean, that's when it just hit me what, what this whole game represented Mm -hmm. and um anyhow it turned it turned into a whole big thing because i shot my mouth off which was a stupid thing to do rather than telling my daughter how how beautifully she played and how wonderful it was Mm -hmm. i started complaining about colonialism (laughs) well i mean But it's, you know, but it is a game um, to them, you know. And I think, I mean, one one of the things we can frame these these changes going on is that the game rules are changing, because the old game has been very top down hierarchical for for a long time, and that's why these 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 patterns of of power and control have been very top down because that's how the the game was played. And I think what's happening now is the whole game rules are, are changing. Right. Um, and you feel that it's going to take um, several generations, three generations, maybe even at least 100 years. You're saying that's how you feel this, this changeover is going to be that gradual. Well, I, maybe, but mm-hmm. actually in terms of, um, oh boy, is that complicated actually. In terms of the, the monarchy, I think not. I think it's going to be well. We're seeing it. Mm-hmm. We're seeing it. You know, the, the the king has now the new. Both kings have married commoners, which one generation ago would not have gone, mm-hmm. and their children are not are. Their children are going to be children of the modern world, mm-hmm. and um and then the whole paparazzi thing, which is an outrageous expression of community and society i mean shouldn't be happening 
that's not okay. And it's the monarchy that makes it, it's not the monarchy that makes it possible, it's the economy that makes it possible because there's money to be made. And when there's money to be made, people will misbehave unbelievably and have. So that's where I'm hoping that the real shift is gonna happen with the economy. And the economy, you know, what will, what will change the economy? Well, I mean, here's what we're seeing right now, this minute in, where I live, which is uh, climate change, which has dried out and heated up the forests so badly that all of Canada is on fire right now. And, and you know, I look out my window and the sky is covered with smoke from fires happening, you know, hundreds of miles from me. The whole East Coast is, mm -hmm. is covered with smoke right now. So, you know, it, it all goes together. And so what am I trying to say here? It's falling apart already. And mm -hmm. once it really falls apart enough, then people will be dying. And they, they're already dying. So that will, that will tumble very quickly, I believe. And, you know, who knows about generations, but individuals. You know, there are going to be hundreds and maybe hundreds of thousands of people dying from one thing or another, which has been happening, but it's been more secret. It's been happening with starvation all over the world, but this is very dramatic. You you can't ignore it when the whole country is on fire. I mean, um, it seems that there's there's cycles within cycles, and some cycles are longer and some are shorter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're talking about culture, I mean, I think a hundred years is reasonable because you know when you went from the, you know. The Egyptian to the Greek to the Roman cultures, you're talking of the shifts of, you know, along you know, hundreds of years, a hundred years is not unreasonable. And, and, and I think the culture, the cell of the culture goes through these morphing changes, which is over a long time. Even a hundred years is a blip in evolutionary time anyway. Mm -hmm. But in the Middle Ages, it took it took like a, a good hundred years to to move out from the monasteries to open up and then move out you know, move their knowledge out into, into post dark ages Europe, and then for the Europe to start to grow again, it took, you know, a century or two. So these are cultures kind of morphing and transitioning. Then you get elements, and then of course the larger scale, you mentioned the climate, well, the earth has always gone through climate shifts. And so I, I think I think it, it's short sighted to, to kind of like, just pin it down to, to one thing like the humans, because that's a political agenda, but climate has been shifting for aeons. And that's been shown by digging in the ice core and seeing these huge shifts. And so, um, of course, civilization is bearing the brunt of it because we've never had such a global civilization on the planet through these whole thwefts of change. So you've got planetary change, you've got cultural change within that, and then you've got societal change within these cultures and within that societal change you've got politics and finance and all these institutions or institutional systems which are going to fall faster because mm -hmm. the cellular culture and the planetary changes are, are, are larger cycles but I, so yes i do feel that um likewise we i mean uh, the financial the health institution or the illness institution as it's probably more rightly known um the political um corruption the the wealth corruption inequality all these i think are going to fall quicker because they're they're human made art artifacts within the culture Look, but what concerns me is that there may be an agenda by certain human for human led forces to try to replace one with the other in a way which is still unnatural. Right. So, for example, if you're trying to bring in a digital currency, which is still trying to, you know, control the movement of wealth and to secure it in, in the, you know, the higher powers and the people are still slaves to basically a capitalist economy, 
then you haven't got change, you've just got replacement, you've got a replicant. And I think there's, if you look at the news now and that, the, the, the false promise is a replicant promise. The new human will be a technologized human, replicant. The new finance will be digital, it's a replicant. Um, to solve the climate will control carbon credits, it's a replicant. You know, it's imposition, which is serving human agenda. What we need to do is allow, I think, natural energies to come in and to transition in a way which is universal law in a natural way. And humanity so far is not going in that direction. And that's where the difficulties come from, because natural forces are going to push through, just as a river, when blocked, will find a new avenue. But we make it harder for ourselves because certain human forces are trying to manipulate it to serve their ends, and it's becoming very uncomfortable for the rest of us. That's right. That's right. So yeah. how do you envision a way to a way through this and a way to shift the focus? I mean, well, I guess, and also, what institutions do you feel need to change? And, and then I'll tell you which ones I think need to change. But go ahead. Well, I think most present institutions will need to go and undergo change. I, I don't see anyone which, which will kind of be spared. Um, definitely the political institution, definitely the financial, uh, definitely the health institution. The educational definitely has to change. Even the religious institutions may not survive this in their present, definitely not in their present form. Um, so, but these are social institutions or socially embedded institutions. And so they're, they're our kind of uh, creation in a way. Mm -hmm. And so any kind of social institution has to change because it, it, it was embedded according to a time and a place and an energy, which is now being shifted from. So if you don't change them, you've got an archaic institution of an old energy trying to survive in a place of a different energy. And so they have to change. But most of those ones I mentioned will have to be radically, or there's scales of change within them. Um, but how is it going to change? It, it, it can only change, in my understanding. Um, we, I mean, but everything comes down to consciousness. Mm -hmm. Because unless we, or humanity, perceives differently, then we won't allow our creations to to mirror that. Okay. If we still believe that you know we are the dominant force, everything revolves around us. We are in a matter reality universe. Um, you know the the vital sacred uh, cosmic energies don't exist. Uh, matter is primary energy, and consciousness is is a secondary byproduct. If we still exist within that bubble, then we are just going to create another replacement of equal archaic energy. So that's why we need to really radically change our understandings of how we perceive what is life, what is the cosmos, what is the role of life and the role of, of human species and all species. So it comes down to consciousness and that I think is gonna take time. Right. Yeah, I'm absolutely with you on all of that. And one of the things that I've been watching with great interest is the Webb telescope. Mm -hmm. um, I have one of my oldest son is an astronomer and he's he's actually a pretty well-known astronomer and he's of the old school. And my child is of the old school. You can imagine what that's like at family gatherings. Um, mm -hmm. So what am I trying to say? So the, the, the vision, I, I think ultimately, I'm just putting what you just said in, in somewhat different terms. Ultimately, it comes down to how we see the nature of reality. And, and the nature of reality, as has been handed down to us in, you know, since recorded human history, has been a three-dimensional construct. And, 
and then imposed upon that these miracles of Jesus and 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 our our the, what is accepted religiously, not by indigenous people, but by so so-called civilized people. So so we have to so it's, it's almost like we have to get back to an indigeneity you know a really ha being dependent upon the land in a conscious way wait i i'm not making myself clear at all partly because i'm trying to say multiple things simultaneously um so here we are totally dependent upon the products of the natural world at the same time as we are destroying the natural world for profit. So those two things cannot coexist for very long and mm -hmm. sustain life. Not possible. So at what, where are the cracks and how do the cracks, you know, and I see as cracks, the, the, um, the common consciousness and the, common economy and the common education you know what we what we accept as essential and bedrock reality to for humans to live in all of which is self-destructive and the self-destruction is now becoming more and more obvious so here we are destroying uh, destroying what we need to live and and the natural world is saying, sorry, you can't do this. Uh, it's too dry here. I'm going to burn up. And is burning a whole portion of a continent as we speak. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be happening more and more on many different levels, I think. And pretty quickly. Because it all has to go together. I mean, every we are part of a, of, of a, of a web. And if portions of the web self-destruct, the rest of the web, web destructs as well. And we're very close to that. I mean, I think we're ha it's happening. So where do, how do we as individuals live that, um, find others who recognize it the way we do and work together keep from destroying one another, which we're very good at. You know, they're all the you know, whole new wars are getting dreamed up and what just happened in the Ukraine yesterday, I think, the breaching of a dam. Do you know about that awful thing? Yeah, yeah, I mean it's on it, yeah, I've seen that, yeah. Um, so that that kind of it's it, there's when a child acts out that way you know that what he needs is time out. Mm -hmm. When whole nations, whole blocks of people act that way, my question is, and it's my question to myself, is what do we do now? Mm -hmm. You know, teaching about consciousness, how do we teach about consciousness in a way that actually gets through? Mm -hmm. So it's, you can't be intellectual about it. You mm -hmm. got to do it some other way. So how how do you do? I said, I mean, it it seems like you said everything's out of sync, and when it's out of sync, the nature's always going to keep on going, you know, and and so we're the ones out of sync, and so it's going to come crashing down. And I, I mean, I see, like you say, the news, and I think it's it's becoming a a, a false um, solution. And people are saying, oh, well, now we have a multipolar world and we have the, the BRICS economies coming up and that's going to be much better now because we can have a more equitable uh, distribution of, of trade and wealth, etc. Um, but that still, for me, is what I call the, the false replicant. You're, you know, just because a multipolar world may be better than a unipolar world in that system, but the whole system doesn't work. So it is no point trying to, you know, um, mend a puncture of the wheel of a car when the whole car is just kaput. Exactly. You know? So yes. I think I think it's a diversion. 
And I think it's, it's a danger that people are getting drawn in by saying, oh, things are going to get better because we've got, you know, we've got these other nations coming up and they're going to balance things out. Well, no, because the game board, the game board is rigged. Let's face it anyway. Both both players or all sides are rigged. And um, it's not, you know, the whole system's not going to work. What I'm looking at is... Um, Yes, reality, rightly so, we, our understanding of reality has to change. But sometimes that needs, uh, sometimes it's not enough for people to be able to change it. Sometimes you need a big shock, an external shock. And perhaps an external shock is going to come, which will blow the fuse and, and totally rearrange things. Now, just, just as an example, um, and I agree with you, we have, we have to go back to the fundamentals, which is, a resonant relationship with the natural order. And so technology is, is unbalancing that because it's running away with itself. And, and that, again, I feel is a false promise, saying technology will solve all our ills, all our problems. But what, what if the sun burps and a huge flare comes and knocks out all our technology? It's that fragile because technology is living within the, a natural order. Cosmic, solar, planetary, natural. So we're still putting our eggs in the wrong basket if we're thinking that this is going to solve our ills and boom, we get a solar burp, i.e. a solar flare, coronal mass ejection, and that can stop everything. Mm -hmm. So would something you feel a larger shift, a larger impact, be able to change our perception of reality? Well, when I try to imagine that I I find myself imagining something which I think is actually realistic um volcanic eruptions mm -hmm. and uh Yellowstone right now which is right in the center of the country and has uh has a a volcano that has not erupted in many years and has been bubbling for many years is really showing signs of of perhaps doing it. If that should happen, for example, it will it will basically cover most of the continent, which is the end of, you know, the end of the civilization mm -hmm. as we know it. So um so I guess my answer is the natural world, I think, will take care of it in one way or another. And I you know, I can't guess what that might be. Mm -hmm. But the pandemic was a wonderful exercise in a sort of preparation for the whole thing shutting down. And I don't know whether you saw any of the footage of what was happening in the emptied cities with the animals coming in from the surrounding wildlands. And I still want to did. Yeah, that I've been I haven't been reminded of that for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was very moving. You know, we were just days away from the beginning of of taking back the land by by the natural world. Mm. Yeah. Um so I personally, and I don't normally say this out loud, I'm expecting something large and dire. Mm -hmm. I don't know what form it will be at all, but I think that's what's that's what's going to kind of, and we are at the end of a cycle, so it's not even inappropriate. Yeah. Are you, are you talking about, do you mean like a, the catastrophe cycle? Well, it, it's actually, no, the world cycles. It's, what is it, 52,000 years mm -hmm. per cycle, something like that. And we are at the bottom point Jack, we've just begun sort of starting up the other side. And these are the cycles like the the ones that are in the Vedas and the Mayan cycles, that that kind of cycle. We are we are at an ending. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing. You say fifty two thousand because there are these cycles of thirteen thousand, twenty six, and then of course double that and you've got fifty two. And I, I I'm not sure that's the right number, but it is that it's mm -hmm. that one. It's yeah. Because, because at intervals of these cycles, according to archaeology, they say you do have these catastrophic 
change as well. Like the Younger Dryas period was about 13,000 years ago, and we're heading into that. So I think there's a lot of indications that a lot of cycles are, are kind of coming together. And that's when you get a big change is when you get several cycles all coming together at a certain point. Well, and that is what we're at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what form is it going to take? Who knows? But the other thing that, that is related to that, that I think about a lot, partly because I'm, I'm an elderly woman now, is death itself. So the, the place that death has in the consciousness of our societies, um, of modern societies, not so much indigenous societies, is that it's, you avoid it at all costs, it's not real, we can get out of this, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that kind of thinking, which is basically fear, you know, fear and loss, has got to change. And I personally feel that it's one of one of the jobs that I have personally to demonstrate approaching death and then doing it in a sort of educational way. Mm -hmm. um, and then what comes along with that is, is it the end of everything? Or is it part of its own cycle? Mm -hmm. And that we don't disappear except in one form, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's a fair point. I mean, as above, so below, the way we conceive of our own physical mortality and death, we've projected that onto these cycles. And we fear that because one cycle comes to the end, it's a death rather than a transitioning state. Exactly. Because, you know, you probably, I think we understand that death is a, is a, change of state mm -hmm. and, and there is no death in in the larger scheme of 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 life because everything is life there's a death of material body but we we've, we've been programmed to fear death all our life we're preparing for death all our lives some people are afraid to walk out of the house because they think that you know death's around the corner mm -hmm. and and this false promise of of technology and transhumanism is in the same mold because they're talking about you can upload your consciousness, you won't have to die, immortality. It's this fear of death which stops us from living. Yeah. Um, and, and, and understanding that biology is, is part of the, the mechanism of life, not, you know, not death. Mm -hmm. So maybe I think we're projecting that onto this, this end cycle and we're fearing death rather than seeing the birth beyond it. Right. Exactly. So that, you know, that said, this is a very exciting time. It's very scary. Yeah, on on several levels. But it's also it's inevitable. Um, perhaps all of us who are on the planet right now came in deliberately when we did in order to be here for this time of shift. And what the, the other piece of that, that I've been wondering about and studying for as long as I can remember is the religious, the, the, the religions of the, the world and the power of the various churches. So how do we, and so here I am living with Christian mystics. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, it's a question. I have to just keep my mouth shut here, but, um, but it's, it's very basic to the kinds of questions that you and I are asking and I, that you have spent your whole life asking and I have spent my whole life asking is how do we, how do we situate our own hearts and minds and souls into this reality that on every level is happening? You know, in my case, my life will be ending soon. My, um, you know, there are fires right north of me. It could be that my life will be ending even sooner. But, and and our collective life may be ending soon. Mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the world council has to break apart. Mm -hmm. And so this may be the perfect timing and the perfect opportunities for us to sort of sink back down into the magma and uh, sleep for a while like you know like the Hindu 
you go back into the what is it the ocean of milk mm -hmm. and uh and you wait until the next era so i don't you know of course i have no idea but my mm -hmm. sense is that's why i'm here and my sense is that ah it's happening mm. so i mean i've always kind of i've been framing it as a kind of mutational time mm -hmm. that it's an evolutionary crisis it's an existential crisis for humanity um i've just been told that i've got 10 minutes left okay so, so if it goes off again i'm just going to shoot you another link okay okay okay, yeah. okay. um because i think you know let's just keep on going until we until we've ready don't let the machine tell us when to stop talking <laughs> are you okay to keep on going yeah, yeah. So as I say, it's a kind of um, a kind of mutational time. Um, so the question is, is it going to be, like you said, a way with humanity and a new species or are some of us going to get through? My feeling is that some of us are going to get through. And, and that's why I, I kind of go into that. I kind of resonate with the idea of, of a certain seed passing on and seed communities and a, 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 and a certain consciousness are going to be transmuted. But the end of humanity in this mode, let's say, isn't finished yet. But um, if you, for those people who can't find, uh, adapt to it or are still stuck in the old systems, the old thinking and that, it's going to be a lot of suffering and, and they may get caught up in, in the, the die off, let's say. Um, so do you feel that th this is a time of, of certain preparation for people to get get on board with, with a whole new way of understanding coming, whole new way of perception coming, having to understand a new reality? Or do you feel that maybe nature would just say, let's start again? Um, I think both and and neither. Um, First of all, looking back at what we are learning these days about what we call prehistory is we've, we've done this before, multiple times, apparently. And there has always been a remnant uh, in one form or another, one physical form or another, that has been the starter, the starter offers. And there, as uh, apparently, they have been finding evidence of, and even living examples of of beings identifying as human in one way or another but who aren't like us so you know bigfoot is is an, an example of that so who knows what's going on but people you know the research that greg and nasim are doing shows that in fact they have the remnants of societies that were much more advanced than ours mm -hmm. um and so it's, it has happened before. We are not. We we didn't start the human. The sure. the human adventure on this planet. So why should we be surprised that it wouldn't kind of go back into the ocean of milk, rest for a while, and then start out again? Mm -hmm. It's happened before. So do I know what I'm talking about? No, but I know what it feels like to recognize that this is not all that there is. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've wondered that since I was a child. It's like, you know, we're not very smart, was the way I felt as a kid. And so, you know, we're, we're really like, like babies beginning to learn things and getting a lot of it wrong. Mm -hmm. So, yep. yep. It's, it's another, it's sort of another try at the same experiment but that's not exactly what you were asking tell me again what your question was because I, I actually have an opinion well it was um about whether you feel that the humanity as, as a whole will be put to the milk and just um this phase will be kind of finished with and then a new humanity a new project or a new civilization or species will come up or whether a, a remnant a part of of our current species will move on through well uh i would like it to be a remnant <laughs> uh it, it depends what takes us out 
you know, how effective it is. Uh, but I think either way, you know, the, the universe doesn't doesn't care about time. So, um, yeah, starting again, why not? You know, starting again with with the 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 atomic structure in the ocean that finally finds its way into form and eventually onto onto the earth. Who knows? Who knows? And and who knows what we don't even can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it has happened before. I'm excited though by what we are learning about things that have been our mysteries um, and what is coming up, you know, as, as the, uh, as more comes up out of the ocean because the land, the land is going to where there's now, it's now covered with water, but it's, things are being revealed, um, is that we are not the first, nor are we the most developed. Um, we've been trying out some some variety of experiment in this form that we call human, um, and we have done many things brilliantly, and mm, I would say most things not brilliantly mm -hmm. at all. So are, are any of us going to be left to kind of continue, or are we going to do another start over? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Who knows? Mm -hmm. um so yes, I mean, I just I'm reminded of um, a phrase that they say that the the philosophy did the philosophy of the fish help it to become an amphibian, um, meaning that do you know all the things we we've learned so far is it really going to help us go to the next stage if we have no idea where we're going? Um, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, like Graham Hancock is another one that's been looking at these kind of. Uh, signs of civilizations having gone through these resets and there'd been even monuments uh, were set up to kind of show that these psychic disasters had would come around to warn the next civilization that these are signs that you know we go through these periodic upheavals and change and you mentioned that perhaps in prior civilizations we'd be more advanced well we you know, Atlantis and, and civilizations like that, which are on the seabed and perhaps coming up and rising like Bimini, Bimini Wall and places like that. So the science are all there. It's just not part of our um, consensus, um, let's say, knowledge. It's ridiculed. It's not talked about. It's pushed away. So the very limited scope of our consensus knowledge, knowledge does not accept that these these histories and cyclic uh, larger cycle of time exist so for many people this is it you know and and again that if, if it's this is it we're we're on a you know we're an accident of life on a dead planet hurtling through empty space then of course we're going to be afraid um but i i my sense is that like all these past great mutational changes and civilizational changes there's an element that always gets through and then it seeds it seeds the next cultural growth and talking about seed you remember you sent me just yesterday you said you came across one of your stories and you thought it was serendipitous to pass it on to me because you came the across yeah. the stone of dacha the dacha stone and when i listened to that reading i think one of the things that came across of that was it seemed to me you were talking about seeding the consciousness because this Dacha stone, before you threw it away in the water, you blessed it and you almost kind of hoping that a new consciousness would be in the stone and it would go out and perhaps seed or be of benefit out there. So mm -hmm. there's an, I'm not sure if you're conscious of it, but it's I as wasn't, if you, but, you wasn't. But, no, that, that's but, the sense I got from it, that you were implying that, you know, you had something valuable with you for many years, and then you decided to to um, gift it. And you gifted it with your energy and your frequency, and you gave it away, hoping that it would be like a seed uh, in the world to come. And that's how I, that's what I sense from it. Oh, great. I mean, that's that's bigger than than I thought, but 
it's exactly right. I mean, it came to me from Dachau and I, I cleansed it in my own studio for, I don't know, 15 years before it felt clean to me. And then it was a stone and I put it back into the earth. That, 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 was, that was what I was conscious of doing. Um, Isn't that a reflection of, of what you've been doing all your life and what maybe certain people are doing? They come into this, this reality terrain, which is quite a corruptive energetic realm. Mm -hmm. And then you, you work, you go through experiences, you work on cleaning yourself up and then your energy, you give it away to try to help what is to come. That's right. Yes, that's right. And that is the spiritual or religious impulse. And so it shows itself in different cultures in very different ways over time. And what we're born into is not necessarily the one that really speaks deeply to us. At least I'm speaking for myself there. Yeah. So, and what has a real hold on Western society is the Abrahamic tradition. You know, Christianity, Judaism, and Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, from my perspective, very faulty on so many levels. And yet it has, it has a grip that won't let go. And that particular grip, okay, this is, this is something I want to run by you. Um, and it has to do with the nature of science. I, you know, my husband was a scientist, two of my sons are scientists, and science was kind of in the family. And then there was I sitting in the middle of it going, nope, nope, not big enough, not big enough, you're thinking too small, and getting into all kinds of trouble with all, all, these, all these scientists on my husband's side of the family. Um, what I am hoping for is that larger recognition or the recognition of a larger reality to take hold before this particular um, this particular set of societies goes out so that whatever comes next is already seeded with it. Seeded is a good word for this. So that it is, and it's here. I mean, the, the young people are, are remarkable in their understanding or the understanding that I recognize as being real, which is much bigger than a three-dimensional understanding. It's, it's much deeper. It's much more intuitive. It is much um, multi-dimensioned. It is much more emotional. It is, it is, uh, you know, it's just a richer variation of what it means to be human. And at the moment, what our societies represent is something that I do, that I see as very shallow, mm -hmm. as very, very partial, as very three-dimensional, without getting that. <laughs> we're, we are much bigger than that. We are potentially. So there's so much more potentially here that the society does not quite recognize or allow to bloom. You know, it's, it's discouraged. So, okay, um, do we have to go out now before we actually manage to do this in, in this iteration of, of planetary life? Or are we going to have a chance with the with the young ones to open into this multi multi sensory multi multi dimensional modality of perceiving the world as much larger than we perceive it now? So it's partly the smallness of our perception that leads to the kind of education we have, the kind of economics we have, the kind of religion we have, which is just you know, it's because paltry, really. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, we are capable of, of a richness that is so much more exciting than what we've 
managed to do so far. Now, if we are at, at one of the endpoints, if the whole thing's got to come down in a, in a series of volcanic eruptions, then it's an opportunity lost unless there is that remnant who will carry that into the next iteration. If there's, if that's not it, and we have to start all over again, that breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's why innately my sense is that we will, there will be a a, a certain section or remnant of humanity that will continue. I don't feel it's over yet, um, and just you know, call it faith. Um, but it's just uh, an intuition, is that we're in, we're in a, yeah, we're in a straitjacket. That's what it feels to me like. You know, we're, our, our perceptions and our um, comprehension and, and all our capacities are, are being pushed in this, in this limited kind of stranglehold. And it's very uncomfortable. And that's why sometimes, you know, we do feel, many people feel out of kind of out of the feeling uncomfortable because we innately know that we're so much more. And so, of course, life is a is a vessel for consciousness and conscious spirit. So it's looking and consciousness needs a vessel in this physical realm to to express out of, to perceive itself out of, to to look back. And I feel that part of this shifting through this this bottleneck or this mutational phase is to allow an expansion of our capacities of perception, expansion of our um, faculties of, of, of psychic faculties as well, so we can relate more to the cosmos. So whatever segment of society gets through this stage, I feel will we'll be squeezed, like the pressure on coal creates a diamond, but you know, to use that analogy. And sometimes you need pressure to create these faculties to make them emerge. And, and why, you know, human, the human vessel, the biological vessel has been in, in preparation and development for a long time. I don't feel it's the end yet because it would throw out the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. So I feel that um, we, humanity will be allowed to go on. Um, but of course, this pruning period will take a lot of people out. But it's not the end because the consciousness may go back into the cosmos and may want another come in and have another try. So it's a lot of vessels will be taken out. Mm -hmm. But through this morphing and mutational phase, it will allow a grander capacity to escape the, the straitjacket. And it's mm -hmm. necessary because if we don't have this, we are just going to annihilate ourselves. Well, may it be so, and that was beautifully put. I mean, you really, you had you had it all. Yeah, I, I'm glad that that actually has gotten recorded, and I hope you'll go back, and then transcribe it and write it down. I mean, it was that was perfect, and I'm totally with you mm -hmm. on my good days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, may it be so. I mean, that's right. Well, you, you get squeezed enough, and it, if you're going to survive, you're going to learn something. Mm -hmm. And if you are too scared to learn something, chances are you won't survive. I mean, like we say, uh, the, the history has been littered with, with plagues and catastrophes and great volcanoes, and we just think they're sporadic, random events because we live in this in this 3D cause and effect or separation kind of mentality. But if we see that as a whole, in a, in a multidimensional way, then we can see that these are all processes to try to advance mm -hmm. the abilities or the capacities of this vessel to, to open up, to allow more in and more through. And perhaps at certain points, junctures, which are coincide with, let's say, cosmic planetary cycles, the opportunity is much more vast to allow growth and a spurt in growth, but at the same time, 
um, it's very painful and a lot is taken out, a lot is pruned. Right, and I think that that may be at least part of the story of these new young ones who are um, considered on the spectrum and who can't really find how to fit their own nervous systems into the society as it is. And it makes them a little crazy, mm -hmm. or in some cases, you know, quite unable to find their own niche here. So I, I worry, I, you know, I want to take every single one of them and reassure them that it's okay to be who they are and how they are and, and to have patience mm -hmm. because they're here, they're doing what they're doing for, for a purpose that's bigger than themselves. And, and yeah, for sure. And weren't were you yourself one of the early waves of these young generations? Because you know, you rightly said you were a pee in the wrong pod. You know, you were in a scientific family, you've always been around groups who you had to work with to because they weren't, you know, synced in with you. It's as if perhaps you're, you know, there are many, many people who are like say, um, the early wave of this coming in who are feeling out of the home environment, out of sync with the world around them, because they're the early resonant, um, you know, the you know, early wave, let's say. Well, that's very perceptive of you. And I've never said it out loud, but um, I think, yes. And um, you know, it took me many years to recognize it. And in fact, I um, found myself, I don't know how many years ago, 30, 30 years ago, maybe, realizing that there was a time lag between the kinds of things I was doing and thinking and anybody knowing what the hell I was talking about mm -hmm. of about 20 years. <laughs> that, and I finally sort of accepted that I was about 20 years ahead of most of the people in my life and wondered whether that was not a pattern on the planet that certain people, you know, sort of what, who is it, St. John the Baptist, who comes in to say the Christ is coming, mm -hmm. um, that, that certain of us come in to do that very job, you know, to be kind of ahead, ahead of, the, of the game so that we can call back and say, come on, look in this direction. So um, that's very perceptive of you to notice that we've never even met in person. Um, but yes, I, I've been I've been doing that for as long as I can remember. Yeah. And probably without consciously knowing it, polishing and throwing the Dhaka stones behind you in your travels to leave behind these these seeds. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I and in fact I've been leaving behind seeds for a long time as well. Um I'm just I'm thinking of before permaculture became a thing, I kind of um I understood those principles and I was uh part of a group of people on a on a piece of land and I created I did, didn't have the word for it, but I created the first permaculture farm um, in that part of California, which is very successful. And then, and and I don't know, 20 years later, the word permaculture came and books started arriving. So I've done that with a number of things. And I, by this time in my life, recognize that it's part of my reason for being here. And so now I want to do it with death and dying. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, use use my own as as my material. <laughs> even behind the seeds, even even on your departure. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's one of the most important things that can be happening right now, because so much of what we do and are is based on fear, mm -hmm. and it's the fear that will that will kill us. You know, we've got to get past the fear, and ultimately, the fear is the fear of our own demise. So, um, you know, I've got the material, I've got the body that will go when it's time. Um, now I just have to find the people to help me do this. 
You can't do it completely alone. And um, and I and I'm finding them here in Vermont. So I don't know. We do what we can do. Mm -hmm. And you're doing what you're doing. Um, I, I mean, I I just watched this wonderful set of of videos and books and stories and and singing that you're putting out there with exactly the same purpose. Would you agree? Yeah. Yes. I mean, um, I don't know how many people pick it up. I mean, a few people pick it up, but you know, but again, I've never looked for a majority. I've always felt that every every seed you put out will will find a few, just a few, not many, but that's enough. Um, but that gives me enough meaning and purpose to continue. And I think that's the crux of it is that um, if you can find something that which gives you meaning and purpose, you're going to do it anyway. And I mean, that's what's fun. Yeah. I mean, even if I get one email back saying, thank you, I appreciate that, you know, that for me is 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 is, is great. It's enough and um, keep me going, in fact, because sometimes I think, you know, who's listening to this? But um, it's what I feel to do and I'm, I still feel blessed being able to do it. So I keep doing it. And, yeah, so um, we're on that same. We're on the same boat. Yeah, and they say, it, and you know, and there's, you know, we're all part of a, you know, a chain. And somewhere behind you will pick up the baton and, and keep on going. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's. I think it's a privilege that we can do this, and, um, you know, right, right, mm -hmm. and then you make friends across the sea, yeah. and that's the good thing. That's the good thing is. Is us having connecting and being friends and having a conversation whereby, you know, if I was an office clerk and that, I wouldn't have had these connections. <laughs> right. And it's, you know, it's this technology that makes it possible, yeah. which I find, even though I, I, I rail against a lot of the technology, the fact is that we can have this kind of conversation mm -hmm. and take it for granted, which is amazing. And it's new. It's very recent. Mm hmm. Yeah, we're we're still babes with our toys, and you know, mm -hmm. the first the, the kids get the first toys in the sand pit. Usually, hit each other over the head with it, don't they? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah. that's what we're doing. A lot of it is hitting over the head until we get to grips with our toys of technology. So, yeah, I still have hope, but I think, as you say, it's going to be um, uncom getting quite uncomfortable for the near future. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah. So it's it's for me very important to have my friends who speak the same language I speak out there to uh, to connect with. So thank you very much for 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 making this happen in the first place, actually. I mean it was Irvin Laszlo who introduced us in, initially. Yeah. Let's continue. Yeah. Well I mean I always always a pleasure to receive your very gracious and kind emails. Um, we've been, I say, on off in touch for the last 10 years and only only infrequently, two or three times have we had a video chat, but it's so always, always a pleasure to receive your contact and know you're out there. So, Carolyn, you know, um, thanks for chatting with me today. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Be very well, and I'll talk to you soon. Okay, we'll do. Thanks.